Hi, my name is Valerie Pascarella, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow with the Northeast Climate Science Center at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. My background is in environmental remote sensing and GIS, and this National, Speci National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar will focus on how we're using Landsat time series for large-scale mapping of invasive species distributions. So to start, I'm going to give a quick overview of what's going to be covered in this webinar. Uh, since this talk is focused on using Landsat time series data, we're going to begin with a brief overview of Landsat remote sensing. After that, we're going to move into some examples of mapping invasive plant distributions and invasive insect outbreaks using time series. And finally, I'm going to end with a brief discussion of uh, how field data collection could be designed to better support uh, remote sensing analysis and move towards integrated detection systems. So for those of you who may not be familiar, the Landsat family of satellites has produced the longest continuous space-based record of Earth's land surface currently in existence. The first Landsat satellite was launched in 1972 and Landsats have been imaging the Earth's surface ever since. In total, eight Landsat instruments have been launched, one of which, Landsat 6, failed to achieve orbit. Um, early Landsat satellites carried what was known as the Multispectral Scanner, or MSS, instrument, which has a coarser resolution and fewer spectral bands than the more modern TM, ETM+, and OLI instruments. Most of the analysis that I'll be showing in this presentation uses uh, data from the later Landsats, although there is efforts to better integrate MSS data going forward. So the TM, ETM Plus, and OLI instruments that we currently use have a nominal spatial resolution of 30 meters. So in this example, we can see um, what would appear as houses and clear tree crowns in a 30 centimeter high resolution aerial or satellite image, uh, like what you see in Google Earth, comes out as kind of big blurry squares in the Landsat image. Essentially what we're getting is an average reflectance signature over a 30 meter aerial unit. So while Landsat images may seem a bit blurry, um, Landsat does have the added benefit of seeing more than what uh, the human eye can see and often has more bands than aerial or uh, high resolution satellite imagery. So Landsat instruments um, have at least well, the more modern instruments have at least six optical bands and one thermal band spanning the visible, near infrared, shortwave infrared, and thermal infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, these sorts of multispectral observations are really important for distinguishing among different ecosystems, land cover types, and as we'll see, even change processes. The other uh, main advantage of Landsat instruments is in the temporal domain. Uh, so here I'm going to play a movie while I explain. Uh, Landsat instruments each have a 16-day repeat time, which means we get an image of the Earth's surface every 16 days. That goes down to eight days if we have two satellites in operation. Uh, what we're seeing here is a movie made of all relatively clear observations over a landscape in New England. And as you'll see, um, we do have to deal with cloud contamination, those big white blurry, sometimes with a bit of pink in there from saturation. Objects that show up are clouds, um, and we have kind of sophisticated masking procedures in place to deal with clouds in our imagery. Um, we can also see a bunch of notable features on the land surface. So those two big dark splotches are uh, open water, they're lakes, um, which shows up as really dark in Landsat imagery. We've also got a big chunk of the Charles River here in Massachusetts. Um, and another thing you'll notice is the greens that fade into browns and occasionally into blues, uh, showing us that Landsat's capturing not just kind of the long-term behavior of ecosystems, but also a good deal of seasonal dynamics. Um, and as we get into these later images, we'll also see those white stripes showing up. Those are artifacts from the Landsat 7 scanline corrector failure, which occurred in about 2003. Um, and again, uh, with our time series analysis, we've been able to deal with those gaps uh, in new ways than have been done in the past. So I talk a lot about time series analysis. Well, why now? In 2008, uh, the USGS 
opened their Landsat archive for free public use following a change in data distribution policy. So while we've had this really robust uh, Landsat record going back to 1972, we haven't been able to access it. Before the opening of the archive, images would cost in the hundreds to thousands of dollars per image. And so something like that little movie I just showed would have been impossible to generate without a massive image budget. Since the opening of the archive, um, there are now 6 million plus images from the various sensors being housed uh, through USGS data distribution centers. And uh, we've seen upwards of 42 million downloads of uh, the archive products. So there's a definitive spike in Landsat use following this free data policy. And so with the access to free data, we've been moving towards these time series analysis that make use of dense records of Landsat observations. Here I'm showing time series for one single Landsat pixel. So this is one 30 meter by 30 meter square uh, tracking reflectance through time. Um, I've converted the seven spectral bands or six optical bands really uh, into these transform measures of what we refer to as brightness, greenness, and wetness. Uh, so that top panel is giving us kind of a sense of overall reflectance uh, over time. The middle panel is somewhat akin to EVI or NDVI, if you're familiar with vegetation indices, essentially an indicator of overall vegetation health and quantity within the pixel. And then finally, that last measure uh, is an indicator of vegetation moisture and structure. And the observations have been color coded by season, which gives us a sense of the seasonal dynamics. And here in this example, we're actually looking at a transition from a largely forested pixel, a dense conifer stand, that's been cleared to create early successional habitat. And that clearing shows up as a definitive break, but across the different bands, you'll see the pattern is somewhat different. We see an increase in brightness, a decrease in moisture structure index, and a change in the amplitude for the greenness index. So what I'm really hoping to show here is that that multispectral dimension uh, adds a lot to time series analysis when we're working with Landsat data. So now that we have access to Landsat time series, the question becomes, how can we use this robust record of the land surface to improve invasive species mapping and monitoring? And so in the next parts of my talk, I'm going to get into a few examples from ongoing research here at the Northeast Climate Science Center at UMass. So in general, remote sensing data sets are really well suited for uh, mapping the large scale distributions of any species, uh, including invasive plants. They provide continuous spatial coverage and are able to capture relatively fine scale variability. In most situations, invasive plants are likely to be detectable if uh, they differ in their spectral reflectance, texture, or phenology relative to the native vegetation in an area. And for a lot of our work, we've been focusing on this phenology element. Um, the temporal repeat time of Landsat, as I mentioned, is 16 days, eight if we've got those two sensors going. So while we may not get enough observations in any given year to look at a clear phenological signal, we can actually make use of the complete Landsat archive uh, to establish a kind of more stable phenological signal. So here we're looking at a time series of all observations over 30 years for a deciduous forest pixel in Massachusetts. And uh, these observations have been plotted by the day of year that they were acquired on. So that x-axis there um, is the day of year going from January through the end of December. And the colors are indicative of what year the observation actually comes from. So when we're looking at kind of this complete picture of all of the observations, that very clear uh, green up and scenario essence of the deciduous forest becomes obvious. And using an algorithm that was developed by Eli Molas and Mark Frito at BU, um, we're able to automatically extract information from this curve. Specifically, we can estimate the annual or long-term mean start of season. So that's the blue dotted line there, roughly the start of spring or middle of the spring transition. Uh, we can estimate a time of peak greenness, so when this pixel kind of reaches its maximum vegetation value for the year. And we can also estimate the end of season or autumn transition shown by that red dotted line. 
And we can generate these estimates for every pixel in a Landsat image. And when we look at multiple Landsat images over a large area, or multiple Landsat stacks over a large area, um, we can generate maps that look like this. So here we're looking at data from five different Landsat scenes covering Massachusetts, uh, parts of Vermont and New Hampshire, down into Connecticut and Rhode Island, a little bit of New York uh, over to the left. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of variability. So this is a composite of the start of spring, peak greenness, and autumn transition uh, for this area. Uh, in this map, the areas that are showing up as green are places that have a relatively late spring and early autumn versus those places in pink that are more of an early spring, late autumn. Um, and you can see that there's clear variability associated with land cover, as well as elevation, latitude, and in those forested areas, the canopy species and understory species. And that's really what we're most interested in quantifying with a lot of our analysis, is what's going on um, with invasives in these forested portions of the landscape. So using a map uh, produced by the Forest Service that shows dominant species by basal area, uh, we were able to pull together this plot, which uh, start, shows the start of season for a variety of different deciduous species. Uh, that line horizontally across the plot is giving you the mean for all of the species. Um, and each box is showing kind of the average over a thousand samples of that species. And we can do this for both start of season and end of season to give us a sense of both when species are greening up, the length of the growing season, and then the timing of their senescence. And what really jumps out in this plot um, is one of our uh, local invaders, Alanthus, or the Tree of Heaven, we can see here that it has a much earlier start of season, so a lower box, much lower than the mean, uh, than most of their deciduous species. Alanthus also seems to have a later end of season, so a longer overall growing season, and these properties um, are quite distinct. Uh, the start of season is significantly different than all of the other start of season metrics that you're looking at here on this plot. Now, this would indicate that a species like Galanthus may be spectrally distinct based on its phenological signature. However, we've got some other invasives on here, Norway maple and black locust, which also show a slightly earlier start of season, um, but not to the extent that the Galanthus are. So these other invasives um, may be more easily confused with the signatures of native species, like for example, the flowering dogwood, uh, which is a native, species here in New England um, that also exhibits this kind of early season green up and late season senescence. So we still have more work to do before we're able to really effectively use these phenological signatures for mapping, uh, but being able to calculate these phenology estimates at a Landsat resolution over large areas uh, is really a significant advance. In addition to canopy species, um, we're also very interested in understory invaders. So there's the expectation that uh, understory invaders like honeysuckle, garlic, mustard, and buckthorn shown here that are known to have an earlier green up uh, may influence the phenology signal uh, earlier in the season. And so similar to the work we're doing with the canopy species, we're also interested in looking at places that are known to have these understory invaders and determining if we can sort out their spectral signature. Um, from more native vegetation as well. So uh, phenology and invasive plants is definitely a, a great research topic for time series analysis. We're also very interested in using the same sorts of time series data for monitoring invasive insect outbreaks. And so there's been a very long history of using Landsat for monitoring damage caused by invasive insect pests. Um, pests cause uh, great deal of damage in the US every year. There's been estimates that pest and pathogen damage in forests can cost upwards of $1.5 billion and extend over, um, over uh, 20 million hectares of impact area, which is an order of magnitude higher than any of the other types of forest disturbance that were assessed in this study by Dale at all. So we know that pest monitoring is a really important topic. Uh, typically, 
uh, pest surveys or damage surveys have been conducted using aerial sketch map techniques, which means that uh, the area that's been being surveyed is flown over and areas that are potentially damaged are drawn onto a map by an aerial observer. And um, while these methods have been used operationally for decades, it's widely known that remote sensing could be an alternative approach to providing more rapid assessment at a lower cost. And so this summer, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but we've had one of the worst gypsy moth outbreaks here in southern New England that we've seen since 1981. So it was headline news and everything from the Washington Post, New York Times, Boston Globe, all shown here. And we saw this as an opportunity to test out some of the time series we already had in place to see if we could use time series data for this kind of monitoring. And so while most remote sensing studies of insect pests rely on some sort of before-after comparison, where you're looking at a data, a data set kind of before damage and comparing that to an image acquired during peak damage, we take a different sort of approach where instead of using individual observations, we use the time series to establish a baseline uh, from the historical data. And so what we're looking at here is again, a time series for just one uh, single pixel. Uh, the observations have been color coded by season. And in that dark gray box, uh, we have a prediction period. So a 10 year period that was relatively stable. And to that period, we fit this harmonic curve, that red line there captures seasonal variability, as well as any kind of long-term patterns in the data. And we use this model to then predict what an image should look like in any given time period. And so kind of zooming in on that period uh, from 2013 to end of 2016, see something like this. In the last few years, those little green points, the summer observations fall relatively close to that red line. So they're really close to the predicted curve. But then going forward into 2016, all of those green points are well below where we would have expected this metric of vegetation greenness to fall. And so by looking at the difference between our observed data points and what we would have predicted from the model, normalizing out for some of the noise we expect in remote sensing observations, we come up with this estimate of condition that we can apply in a couple of different ways. So as the defoliation event was kind of proceeding, um, we were able to use these snapshots to look at what was going on. So this image was actually acquired before the outbreak really hit too heavily. This is uh, in early June 2016. And you can see that most of this scene is covered in blue. So uh, the condition assessment was relatively close to normal. We see some areas of yellow and red. These are areas that would be flagged as potential changes in condition. However, most of them are falling on the edges of those black splotches, which are our masked clouds. And so we assume that those are just uh, mist clouds and cloud shadows uh, that are causing those differences between the observed and predicted model. Now, this is in contrast to an image acquired on June 18th, so only a couple of weeks later, and we're starting to see a lot more yellow tones in this image and some red tones in some isolated pa uh, patches. And so if we look at these areas, those are indicative of potential damage. Um, so in this one image, we can say, okay, well, these are places that maybe we direct aerial surveys or on the ground surveys to verify that they're damaged, but they're large scale patterns that are likely to be associated more with insect activity than something small like a housing development. Um, and our confidence in these patterns kind of grows over time. So with the two sensors in operation, we got an image uh, one scene over only a day later. And here we see those same uh, areas of damage we saw in the preceding image, so not likely to be clouds in this case, as well as a much larger area of damage covering a good portion of Rhode Island there. And so we can continue this way, kind of using these snapshots on each date to provide a short-term assessment of damage, more in the early detection rapid response framework. Um, 
But at the end of the season, we can then incorporate everything from those individual snapshots of which I have quite a few more uh, into season integrated metric. So in this figure, I'm just showing the number of observations over the entire growing season. So for these two scenes that we kind of did our pilot study on, um, in the scenes to the right and the left, we got about uh, six to eight observations of condition, where in that overlap zone, that brighter white area, we can have upwards of 16 assessments of condition. And if we average our deviations from uh, what we would predict based on the model over all of the available assessments that we got, so anywhere from those eight to 16, maybe fewer if there were some clouds in there, then we mask out what's non-forest, so those areas in dark blue are places that we know are not forested. We got a pretty clear picture of uh, the defoliation damage from the 2016 season. And just to give you a perspective on uh, how this compares to the more conventional aerial surveys, uh, here we're zooming into the Massachusetts Rhode Island border. Um, those black boxes and kind of polygon shapes with the cross hatching are the areas detected as damaged by the uh, Forest Service aerial surveys. Um, and underlaying is the map uh, that we produced of potential damage. And you can really clearly see here that our map provides much more precise estimates of the area damaged. Um, it overcomes issues of differences in methods across state lines. So Massachusetts has a very different uh, survey approach than Rhode Island. Massachusetts using these polygons while Rhode Island's using grid cells. Um, we also are able to provide a better estimate of the magnitude of damage. While these polygon data sets do have assessments of uh, categorical damage scales saying very light uh, all the way through very severe, um, our map actually puts a quantitative continuous scale to that, giving you a metric uh, ranging from zero, which would be no damage, to a uh, deviation of uh, negative four or greater, which would indicate very high likelihood of severe damage. And so um, we envision that going forward, we could come up with a uh, online forest disturbance monitoring system uh, that has kind of three stages. In that first stage, we're fitting those models to the stable base period, giving us a stable uh, baseline to compare new images against. Um, during a monitoring phase, we can use the incoming images from Landsat, compare those to predicted images, and generate these near real time per scene defoliation products or insect damage products that can be used to guide field surveys and aerial surveys um, that would be necessary to attribute the damage to specific pests. And then at the end of a given season, we can provide some sort of final assessment map where we're using all of those real-time snapshots uh, that have issues like cloud cover and scan lines, and we kind of smooth them out and generate these averaged metrics um, that can give a sense of total area of disturbed over much larger swaths. So you saw there, I was able to combine assessments for two different Landsat scenes uh, to cover a larger area. In addition to uh, monitoring disturbance, the other avenue that some of the pest work can go uh, in, in terms of species composition mapping. So as a bit of an aside, I've done some work and I'm continuing some work on mapping forest species composition using time series features. So features like uh, the phenology features I showed earlier, as well as some features derived from those harmonic curves like amplitudes, which capture seasonal variability and the intercept, which captures kind of a long-term uh, overall reflectance, uh, we're able to use those to improve our ability to distinguish those canopy species on the ground. And so here we're looking at a map of the probability of a central hardwood community with the white areas being uh, places that are more likely to be dominated by oak and hickory species that form these uh, central hardwoods. And uh, this is important for pest monitoring because our insect pests tend to have uh, defined host species. So in this case, gypsy moth tend to prefer oak over other types of hardwoods uh, and conifer species. So by knowing where the host species are, we can also improve our ability not just to monitor damage from pests, but to think about where damage might occur in the future. Um, and it's important to point out that all of these analysis, the forest species composition, uh, forest pest monitoring, and our plant invasion uh, detection, 
are all based on the same time series data for this study area. And so we're able to take this data set and use it in a bunch of different interrelated ways. Now, the Landsat time series data sets that I work with uh, do require quite a bit of uh, storage and computing capacity, lots of specialized software in order to do the processing. So the expectation is not necessarily that everybody interested in invasives will be able to conduct this sort of analysis themselves. However, uh, all of these studies do require really sound uh, ground-based data and field-based efforts. So I think there's a lot of potential for uh, improving the way field data is collected so that we can use that data to inform the sorts of work we're doing with Landsat time series. Uh, as many of you know, uh, with the advent of smartphones, readily available, inexpensive GPS units, uh, there's been a great increase in uh, the recording of invasive species data and a lot of this data being archived through projects like EdMaps and IMAP. Um, this information, again, is very critical for connecting uh, what's happening on the ground to what we're seeing from remote sensing instruments. However, not all data is created equal. Uh, some of the types of data that is recorded and submitted to these uh, interactive databases is more useful than other sources of data. And so here I'm hoping to provide a bit of guidance from the remote sensing perspective on what sorts of data is most valuable to us. So the status quo for uh, collecting invasive species data and any sort of kind of species uh, distribution data tends to be collecting presence information. So whether or not a species was observed at a particular location. Now this is really good for early detection and rapid response. We want to know when certain species are showing up in particular locations, helps us model general invasion patterns, but this is only a partial predictor of uh, of invasion as well as risk of future invasion. And so while presence data is good, it's much better for us if uh, data is recorded in terms of abundance. So abundance being not just whether something's in a place, but how much, uh, how many individuals, how many stems, how much cover uh, is in a given location. This is again, a kind of point data set, uh, but because we have, information on how many, uh, the data becomes much more useful for species distribution and risk modeling. In other words, it's really different if we have one stem of garlic mustard or one individual hemlock woolly adelgid as opposed to a thousand stems of garlic mustard or a thousand uh, little adelgids on a hemlock tree. And so by understanding that uh, abundance information, we can do a better job uh, trying to use remote sensing data to connect to places that have been invaded. Um, and it's important to note as well that remote sensing is typically not going to be able to detect very low abundances. So if you only have one or two individuals, it may be hard to pick up in a spectral signature or a temporal signature. However, um, it's important to use higher invaded places in risk modeling. So even if we can only detect the most highly invaded sites, uh, that information is useful for predicting where species might invade in the future. And a final point for your abundance data, um, it's not just important to know where things are, but where they aren't. So recording absence data, which is often overlooked, is very important. If you're doing a survey, don't just let us know where you did see things, let us know where you didn't as well. So that's kind of our better scenario, but really the best source of data for remote sensing studies is data that's directly scalable to remote sensing pixels. So in this case, we're talking about um, different types of density metrics. And to give a couple examples and maybe some recommendations on how to think about what you might record in a field-based survey of uh, density, um, here I've got a couple of tables for uh, plant invasion. So in terms of plant, we might think about recording uh, percent cover relative to a remote sensing pixel or another unit of area. Um, and we also might think about stem count, again, considering how big an area you're counting stems over. Now, in both of these cases, uh, quantitative information on percent cover and stem count is more useful than qualitative, really honing in and giving us specific information 
on what you're observing in a place. Now that doesn't mean to go as far as to say there's 23% cover of a given species. Giving a range like five to 25% is helpful. Um, in fact, it's more helpful than kind of taking a mean of a range, like give us a distribution of uncertainty. Um, and those quantitative estimates, again, more useful than scales like low, moderate, or high that uh, are difficult or impossible to translate back into quantitative metrics. Um, for plants, again, cover and stem count are probably the two uh, most useful metrics. And these are going to depend on the area uh, you're measuring them over. And that area should be reported with your cover data. So if you're surveying over a 30 meter pixel, uh, it needs to be made clear somewhere in the metadata or in the um, source information that this percent 1% cover is relative to a 30 meter pixel. Uh, for insect pests, uh, along the same lines, we might provide things like a defoliation estimate to validate the maps that I showed earlier. Here I'm showing the um, scale used by the Forest Service in their aerial sketch mapping, which could easily translate to remote sensing studies uh, with both those quantitative and qualitative descriptions. And again, uh, recording this sort of information requires that you not only define a percent cover, but also the area that that cover was relative to. And so um, when you're thinking about defining these areas, there's a couple of different ways a study could be designed. On one hand, you could target one sensor. Like I said, you could measure over a 30 meter pixel and everything is scalable directly to Landsat observations. Or alternatively, you might wanna use something like a nested plot design shown here, where you might record information at a smaller unit, say a one meter vegetation sample plot, have a set of one meter plots embedded within a 30 meter area representing a Landsat pixel, so giving us a sample of cover within that 30 meter area. And then that 30 meter pixel could be uh, further embedded into a larger study area representing, say, a MODIS, which is another um, coarser resolution optical sensor. Uh, pixel, which is about 250 meters. So in this case, uh, the study design would be useful across a range of different uh, remote sensing instruments. Um, again, this example focused on vegetation. One thing I do want to point out is looking at that one meter square, we're seeing a bit of vegetation as well as background. When we're talking about proportion of cover for vegetation, um, remote sensing thinks a bit differently uh, in that we're not necessarily interested in the percent of vegetation that a species comprises, but rather a proportion of cover types. So here we would want you to record information both on the background characteristics, that bare soil, as well as uh, the invasive species cover that's observed um, so that we can relate uh, that back to the spectral signature observed with the remote sensing instrument. Um, and in terms of uh, invasive insects, you might want to think of this in percent damage and then it record information, say the host species, which again could affect that spectral signature. Gypsy moths defoliating a conifer stand is going to look a little different than if they're in their preferred oak habitat and that's going to affect uh, what our signal looks like. And so if possible, we'd love to see more of these area estimates uh, getting into databases. Um, it may not always be possible to record area. So as a next best thing, we would love to see more just abundance and absence data uh, when cover types may not be uh, possible. And so just to go back in summary over uh, to summarize what's been presented in the talk so far, uh, Landsat time series are an exciting new long-term record of ecosystem properties and dynamics. We've had Landsat data since the 70s, uh, but it's really just been since the opening of the archive in 2008 that we've been able to use these records uh, to look at ecosystems over the full Landsat record. The examples I show are indicative that time series data can be used to detect the unique phenologies of invasive plants. And we're looking forward to continuing on with this work and hopefully producing maps of invasive plant distributions uh, derived from time series estimates. 
Time series data can also be used to rapidly map insect pest damage over large areas. So as you showed, we were able to look at the 2016 gypsy moth outbreak here in southern New England in close to near real time, providing assessments of condition as images came in, as well as uh, in retrospect across an entire season. And the real take home message in this talk uh, being that progress in our remote sensing analysis of invasive species distributions and impacts is going to depend on these scalable on the ground observations. So uh, those processing time series data really need the help and support of the field based communities who are able to provide us with information we can use to validate and improve uh, remote sensing products. And so if you were really interested in some of the things that you heard during today's webinar, I'd love to direct you to a couple of studies. Um, Bethany Bradley's paper on remote sensing of invasive plants, reviewing spectral te te textural and phenological approaches uh, is a great resource and a couple of the figures on invasive plants were pulled from there. Um, remote Sensing of Forest Pest Damage uh, by Ron Hall et al. Uh, this paper is a Canadian perspective, but provides a great overview of how remote sensing is being used in pest assessment, and many of the species are found in both Canada and uh, the United States. And finally, I uh, point you to my own paper on using time series of all available Landsat observations to more generally map and monitor ecosystem state and dynamics. There's a lot more time series figures in there, a lot more to think about on what we might use with, do with the Landsat temporal domain. Um, so I invite you to check out all of these papers uh, if you want to learn more. Uh, so I want to give a brief announcement for our Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Working Group. Uh, this is a group at the Northeast Climate Science Center, uh, which I'm a part. Uh, we have a great listserv if you'd like to be included. Uh, shoot an email to Carrie Brown Lima. Her email address is up there in blue. Um, and the listserv provides great information on uh, invasive species publications, um, upcoming events, and uh, just general communication around invasive management in the Northeast. We are also going to be holding our first annual symposium at UMass Amherst uh, at the end of July. So July is 27th and 28th. Um, and we definitely invite uh, anyone listening in to attend if they can. Uh, and again, if you contact uh, Carrie Brown Lima at her email address and get on our listserv, you'll get more information as our symposium plans unfold. And finally, as the end, uh, if you have any unarchived spatial data on invasive, so data you haven't uploaded to EdMaps or IMAP, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, we do a lot of work with invasives using spatial data, and so uh, we're always looking for new sources. If you have unarchived spatial data, uh, you can contact me, uh, Valerie Pasquarella, B-A-L-P-S-Q at UMass, or Bethany Bradley, her email address address is up there as well, and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. I'm going to throw Carrie's email up there as well, so it stays on the screen, and I should have time for a few questions. And while I'm taking my questions, I'm just going to continue that little Landsat movie from earlier, so everyone has a chance to watch for a second time. With that, take my questions. Hi, Valerie. Okay. Uh, first one is, uh, do you have any thoughts on how NEON, or acronym N-E-O-N, observations might complement your work? So I personally haven't uh, worked much with NEON data, but I do think that any long-term ecological data set uh, like what NEON's doing uh, could be integrated with time series analysis, whether it's providing us more information on climate, um, on carbon dynamics, all sorts of other good stuff. So no, I haven't done specifically anything with NEON, but I look forward to any sort of potential integration with other long-term monitoring sites in the future. How do you compensate for Landsat 7 SLC failure in your long-term time series? Yes, yeah, so while we're watching this movie, it'll start showing up shortly. Uh, the scanline corrector failure was definitely a big issue when we were conducting image-based analysis. So when those stripes start showing up, uh, which they should any second in the video, there they go, um, those are data lost. We cannot recover uh, 
for those pixels. However, when we're doing a time series analysis, uh, we're looking at data from the pixel perspective. So we're pulling all clear or good observations at an individual pixel scale. That means if a scan line happens to be in an image, we just don't have data for that pixel in that image, but we can keep all of the data from the good portions of the image. This is really a significant advancement um, since we're able to make better use of what data we have rather than being restricted by uh, data losses from scan lines, as well as even from clouds, cloud shadows, and snow. How do you separate cl climate disruption and invasive presence as the forces behind earlier or later greenness? It's definitely a tricky problem. And so we know that our phenological signature that we're looking at uh, from the spectral data is going to be a product of interactions between uh, canopy composition, understory composition, climate, topography, and latitude. And so uh, the preliminary estimates I'm showing are, are just the satellite-based estimates. What we're hoping to do going forward is to start to tease out those more nuanced processes. So. Uh, for example, controlling for latitude and elevation and looking at similar species composition, seeing how they differ. Um, and so, yeah, the goal is to eventually use this information to build a more robust model that would allow us to tease out what's attributed to an invasive versus a difference in canopy composition or environmental factors. Is it possible for any user to download the pixel level data from any Landsat data? Currently, the asker is uh, indicating they download in path or row format. Yes. So data is still largely available in path row format from the USGS, although there are efforts underway uh, to produce what's called analysis ready data or ARD that will be more easily integrated um, across scenes. So thinking back to that figure that I showed with the overlap uh, in ARD, you would be able to pull values from both adjacent Landsat path rows uh, for an individual pixel. But for the time being, uh, the bulk of our analysis is still run on these scene based uh, uh, stacks of images where we're able to take all of the images for one scene and pull out pixel values. Um, and the formatting of the scene data allows this because our scene products are now coming or they're rectified, uh, atmospherically corrected. So we really are able to just stack everything we've got for an individual place and then look at the time series uh, for each pixel. Is the resolution of the satellite data expected to improve with, with future technology enhancements? So the current Landsat satellites have a 30 meter resolution. Uh, Landsat 9, uh, which will be launched hopefully in 2020, uh, is, expect is a direct clone of Landsat 8. So we'll still have that 30 meter resolution through at least Landsat 9. There is talks of potentially reducing resolution, maybe down to 10 meters for Landsat 10. Um, and this uh, is a good match with the European Space Agency, so ESA's Sentinel series. So Sentinel 2A and 2B um, do have uh, bands that are comparable to Landsat in the visible and near infrared at a 10 meter resolution. So as those sensors come online and data processing gets more refined, there should be some 10 meter data available. Uh, the hope is that we can start integrating those kind of finer resolution Sentinel data sets with the Landsat time series um, and come up with fusion approaches that will maybe get us a little bit finer scale detail. But as I mentioned, for the time being, Landsat's still going to be at 30 meters, uh, though that may change in the future. Have you looked into how leaves coming down in the fall may interrupt ground cover invasives data? We have not, although that's an excellent thing to think about. Uh, yeah, here in New England, we've got a lot of deciduous species, as I showed on my species plot there. So uh, yeah, those leaf fall could potentially cover up inv uh, invasive understory plants. However, we would think that um, that most of the plants would kind of be adapted to, to poke through whatever's coming at them from the canopy. So uh, yeah, it's a good thing to, to be thinking about and to potentially consider uh, when we're doing those late senescing species. How about shot holing or herbivory? Is that a visible sing signal? Yeah, so uh, when you say shot holding, I'm thinking like really small scale herbivory. We know that herbivory is going to show up um, in our signals no matter what. 
Uh, there are lots of herbivores in the New England forest, uh, and many of them don't defoliate as severely as the gypsy moth, uh, and they're pretty widespread. So we're always going to see some effects of herbivory in our time series signal. If we think all the way back to when I showed those phenology curves, uh, they have an asymmetrical shape, and we attribute that, you know, leaves come out, they're fresh and green and new, um, and they've got their kind of greenest state. And then over the course of the season, leaves age, they're nibbled on, and so we see a slow decline through to true senescence in autumn. So I think that kind of low level of herbivory is already a default part of our signal, uh, something that we're always going to see. Uh, it's really those extreme events, uh, defoliators like gypsy moth or even to some degree winter moth that cause more of a large scale outbreak level defoliation that we're trying to characterize with these newer techniques. Is it prohibitively expensive to augment Landsat data with hyperspectral data? Yes, so there's always a question, you know, hyperspectral has shown a great potential for use in species. Uh, composition mapping, there's been a lot of work on invasives using hyperspectral, but as you're mentioning, uh, it is expensive to fly hyperspectral instruments. Uh, they're typically mounted on aerial platforms, um, and so you have to fund, you know, those individual flights, and you are also only going to get a small uh, area. So prohibitively expensive is going to depend on what your budget is. Um, there's definitely a potential to start looking at connections between aerial or yeah, aerial surveyed hyperspectral data. Um, but I do think that the, yeah, the idea of using the temporal domain from Landsat is potentially a surrogate for needing so much spectral information. Instead of re relying so heavily on a single snapshot with lots and lots of tiny little spectral bands, uh, we're able to use the temporal domain and Landsat's broader bands um, in order to tease out similar things like species composition uh, that could be relevant. So again, I think it's uh, definitely costly to have hyperspectral data and I'd love to push towards thinking about how we might use free Landsat data to accomplish similar goals. Can your models be used in tropical regions or is it a seasonality of a fundamental requirement? Yes, so the harmonic models that I showed are designed to capture seasonality, um, but we've had lots of success running similar sorts of um, models in tropical areas, typically for looking at abrupt changes, so more like that clear cut that I showed pretty early on. Uh, my paper that I showed the citation for in Remote Sensing and Ecology and Conservation does have a few examples uh, from tropical mangroves as well as some tropical Amazonian forests in Colombia. Uh, there the problem is less the lack of seasonality as it is a far fewer number of observations. And so in uh, tropical areas, we tend to have lots of cloud cover. You saw all those clouds in the time series move movies. It's even worse down there. So we got far fewer good observations. And therefore, the lack of seasonality is kind of a benefit because we're not missing huge parts of that phenological curve. We're able to say we expect this to be relatively consistent. We only have a few observations, but it's still enough to fit a representative model. So there's different hurdles in tropical areas, uh, but the models that I'm using are designed to work uh, in both temperate zones and tropical zones. You may just have to tweak some of the parameters and fine tune for your study area, but that's going to be true for any new site, uh, not just jumping across regions like that. Okay, Valerie, this is our last question. What methods do you use to detect and remove outliers from time series data? Ah, good question. So we talked a little bit about clouds. Um, we do use the default uh, FMASC product. Uh, FMASC is an object-based cloud detection algorithm that's now run for every single Landsat image uh, that comes into the USGS archives. That FMASC mask is applied on an image-by-image -image basis to kind of take out the bulk of uh, those big noticeable clouds. Um, and then in our time series processing, we do a second masking step where we actually use the time series data to look for outliers. So we look for places that uh, observations are either really, really bright relative to all of the other observations in the time series uh, that might be cloudy or observations that are really dark, which may be indicative of a cloud shadow. And we run this additional filter based on kind of deviations from um, 
kind of expected behavior in the temporal domain to get rid of those cloud and shadow outliers uh, in the second masking step. So uh, FMask is our first go-to, kind of what's already included, and then the second processing tends to get rid of outliers. There's always still a few that hang in there, and the model is designed to be robust to them, uh, but we have paid a lot of attention to uh, how quads are masked so that we can get down to just the most usable, high-quality data for time series analysis. All righty, ma'am, that was, were all of our questions for today. Great. Thank all right, well, thanks for having me for this webinar, and I hope to hear from some of you looking to either join our listserv or maybe some unarchived spatial data you'd like to share. Happy National Invasive Species Awareness Week. <laughs>